brought to you from Melbourne, Australia. This is the Badminton Podcast, a community for badminton players by badminton players, where we talk badminton, celebrate local heroes, interview players from all walks of life, and push you to grow as a player and a person. Introducing your hosts, Jeff and Henry. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Badminton Podcast, proudly sponsored by Volant Wear. My name is Henry. And my name is Jeff. And we're here to show you that your love of badminton doesn't have to end on court. It's time to show the world how incredible badminton is. And we're here to support you on your journey to become better badminton players. And not just that, if you're willing to take this journey with us, maybe we can grow and become better people too. Today, there's just no holding back. The true fanboys in both of us will come out for this gentleman. (laughs) Over to you, Jeff. So today we're going to talk to someone who I admire a lot. And I know that a lot of people around the world really respect and idolize this badminton player. But rather than me telling you exactly who it is, I'd love to just give you a bit of an introduction and see whether you can figure out who it is. Okay, so have a listen to this. He is a 33-year-old, soon to be 34, Danish player who's been playing on the badminton circuit professionally since he was about 20 years old. He's currently ranked number 32 in the world in men's singles, but has spent time in the top 10 on two separate occasions a few years back for several months. One of his most famous shots, in my opinion, on YouTube is when he played against Lee Chong Wei in the finals of the 2015 US Open, where he hit a winner over Chong Wei's head from between his legs to save game point. He also won the winning point that helped Denmark take the Thomas Cup finals in 2016. No secret recipe, it's just uh, to be open about both the problem and the solution and work hard to get through it. Hard work. You need to find a way to to have fun with what you're doing, even if it's hard. And you need to be open-minded to uh, all the input you can get. No matter what you do, if it's uh, a sports or if you work in an office. If it's something you enjoy, then why not keep on doing it as long as you can? Does anyone know who it is? Henry, I know that you know who it is, but is that a pretty good assumption that people would know? Definitely. I mean, I've seen that video many, many times and I'm sure HK, uh, well, I've, I've, I'm blown his oh, cover now. I'm, I'm <laughs> blown his cover. Henry, what are you doing? <laughs> so <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce on this podcast, Hans Christian Biddinghus or HK Biddinghus. HK, thanks so much for being on the show. Hi guys. Thanks so much for inviting me. I'm <laughs> so ready after that introduction. It was amazing. Spot on. <laughs> <laughs> so just for everyone listening, when I asked HK to introduce himself, he said these things. So he said, look, I would describe myself as an open-minded and hardworking guy who's just generally a huge badminton fan and also a sports fan who happened to become really good at badminton himself. Outside badminton, he is married to a Norwegian dressage horse rider, Selena. And together they have a wonderful son, Vincent, who's almost two years old and two dogs named Billy and Chili. That's pretty cute. He's a huge podcast listener. He's been on podcasts himself as well. And he's very, very excited to join the soon to be biggest podcast originating (laughs) from Australia. (laughs) Exactly. So just a quick question before we jump in. Now, what is a dressage horse rider? Uh, Well, dressage... It's basically horse dancing. It sounds ridiculous. It's uh, equestrian. Uh, it's, it's also part of the Olympic program, actually, but it's not really one of the most uh, commercialized uh, sports in the Olympics. But yeah, it is, uh, it is uh, an Olympic sport. Uh, so they try to make the horses uh, do different uh, difficult exercises, like uh, walking in different ways, uh, which is supposed to be pretty difficult. I don't really know. I don't, uh, I don't ride horses, but yeah, it's supposed to be really difficult. I'm not, I'm not much into the sport, but uh, yeah, that's what, what she's doing. So she's training the horses and uh, trying to make them uh, perform at a higher, higher level. Yeah, so that that's basically it. Oh, great. I learned something today. I hope everyone listening learned yeah. something today because yeah. I, I had no idea what that was. Actually, Henry is a vet and he know, he knew what it was when he read it. So 
Yeah. All right. Yeah. Surprise. Uh, how was my description, <laughs> Henry? Was it okay? Oh, it was very good. Uh, very right. good. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's an art in itself, dressage. It is. And following on, I mean, how how good is Selena at dressage? Uh, well, she's very good with the young horses. Uh, the last uh, four years in a row, she's been uh, participating at the the world championships for young horses. Uh, so that's the equivalent to uh, the junior world championships in badminton. Wow. Um, she she's working uh, in a uh, I think it's called a stud in English, where they they breed horses and then they train them, but they try to sell them before they really reach their uh, would you call it like a grown-up age? Mm-hmm. Uh, so they try to sell them early and then they s- start all over again. Uh, so she hasn't really had the chance to have horses uh, at their very uh, physical peak, but she's actually trying to change that a little bit now uh, so she can perform at an even higher level also at the, the senior level. So she's going to have her debut in what is called a Grand Prix uh, in January. So that's going to be exciting for her. Well, fantastic. We wish her all the best for that. Thank you. And HK, just moving on with your CV. Now, you've got such an impressive achievement record in badminton, being in the top 10 twice for several months and having different titles and being part of the Danish team. So your badminton journey, how did it get started? What's the story? Well, it's, it started uh, actually by coincidence. Me and my family had just moved from uh, the northern part of Denmark to a small city uh, a little bit north of Copenhagen. Uh, so it's about four, four or 500 kilometers, which is a lot in Denmark. It's a very small country. Uh, and uh, we got this flyer in the, in the mail from the local badminton club. And my oldest sister, I have two older sisters, and the oldest one thought it sounded interesting to, to go and try this badminton thing. They had a, uh, a Saturday uh, child a badminton session where you could go with your parents and uh, it was like 50% just playing around and 50% badminton training. Uh, so yeah, my older sister wanted to go and then my parents uh, thought it would be a good idea to send all of the kids. So yeah, we just uh, went along, me and my younger sister, and then uh, it caught on from there. Uh, my, my sisters also kept on playing for a few years, but uh, I was the only one who really got uh, bitten by uh, like a badminton bug. I, I never really stopped playing uh, again after that. And so how old, were, how old were you when you started back then? I was uh, five, uh, my sister's seven and nine. So yeah, I've been playing since I was five. So it's uh, next summer, it's gonna be 29 years. Wow, congratulations. Yeah, thanks, soon, soon an anniversary. <laughs> it's big. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Three decades in the sport. Yeah, exactly. And I still love this <laughs> just as much as I did, did back then. Uh, hasn't really changed over the years. Yeah. Well, what do you think, uh, you know, kept you in the sport and, and pushed you to, to become such a good player compared to your sisters? Obviously, they, they continued the sport as well. But what pushed you to get to that professional stage? Well, basically, I think I just kept on going because I, I genuinely think badminton is a lot of fun to play. It's been like that for me all the time that I just really enjoy playing. I enjoy the training. And I think at least in, in Denmark, there's so much focus in the early years on all the social aspects of badminton as well. So it was just like never, I was never sick of going uh, for a tournament or training or anything because you know, you had all your friends there and there was so many social activities as well. So you, you mix that together with the badminton and it just uh, kept, making uh, yeah, every journey and every uh, every training a lot of fun. Of course, there's days where you're a little bit tired, where you're maybe not as ready as the other days. But in general, I would say I just, I found it fun to play all the time. And as soon as I started becoming really good and I saw there was a chance that I could maybe make a living out of it, then I thought, yeah, why not? If you can do something that you enjoy doing every single day uh, and you can make a a good living out of it, then then why not go for it? I think no matter what you do, if it's a a sports or if you work in an office, if it's something you enjoy, then why not keep on doing it as long as you can? Yeah, I completely agree with that. And going back, hey, Che, going back to what you talked about as a child and the Danish system really enforcing how important fun is around the sport. I do remember seeing, I think it was on Facebook, that Victor Axelsson wrote an article. I'm not sure if you read that, HK. 
mm-hmm. about I did, yeah, I did, yeah, yeah about some a lot of people asking him hey what should my child be doing at this young age should he be doing this private session private coaching and he kind of just said look we just had fun and that's what keeps you in the sport mm-hmm. and I think that's really really important that although it's good to be serious about the sport you just need to have fun as a kid otherwise it's going to get tedious and and just in your opinion and what you've seen, HK, have you seen that happen a lot of times? So, for example, if someone gets really serious really early and they burn out? Uh, I, I don't have an example of someone who, who did it, but I, 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 can, I can just say for myself that I, I also played football until I was a uh, soccer. I don't know what you call it in Australia, but... Uh, yes. Yeah, we call it soccer. soccer yeah, soccer. We're, we're a bit weird here. Yeah. <laughs> you call it soccer. All right. Yeah. I I, play, I played soccer uh, until I was uh, 12 years old. So I also started when I was six. Uh, and I actually quit that sport because the coaches uh, started becoming really serious. And it was all about trying to win and get the results and everything. It wasn't really focused on just enjoying the sport. Uh, and that was obviously at a very young age. So it, it made it easy for me to choose between those two sports. I, I also played football at a decent level at that time. But there was no doubt in my mind that I, I wanted to choose badminton because I was just having fun, really. Uh, even training hard, I, I had fun. Um, I read the article that uh, Victor put out, and I, I fully agree with him that having fun is much more important than the young years. It, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be training hard or shouldn't be doing serious stuff in training. But I, I'm not sure that uh, individual sessions uh, four times a week is the way forward for a, a 12 or 13-year-old kid. On the contrary, I think it's better to uh, to just play for the fun of it, and then you also then you invest the hours that are needed to to become a really good player. Uh, I, I think that's way more important in the in the young years. Um, but I know times also changing. It's a little bit different today than it is when I was a junior player uh, twenty years ago. Like back then, when I was 12, 13, 14 years old, uh, after I quit football, I actually started playing tennis during summertime. Because we didn't have any badminton training in the in the summer months, because the the clubs just closed down for for summer. Uh, it's not like that anymore here. And now they, I think they have two weeks off, and then it's back to training. So things change, but I'm pretty sure that it's not a bad thing for me that I actually got to play both soccer and also tennis. It's a big reason why I think my athleticism is pretty good, actually. So yeah, I, I would recommend young players to just try as many different sports as possible, have as much fun as possible. That's way more important than how many uh, individual skill sessions you uh, you have with a, with, a, with a coach, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree as well. I mean, it's really important at those younger ages and the formative sort of years that, you know, you're exposing yourself to all the various kinds of opportunities and, and mm. basically experiences as well um, at those ages. And just to throw a curveball at you, HK, and we're talking about fun, right? So mm. for those of you in the audience who aren't familiar with HK and, and watching HK play uh, live or in video, you'll find that HK does a lot of very special dives. So when you're talking about fun, <laughs> HK, were you, were you practicing dives at those younger ages, younger ages? Is that what you meant by fun? I've, honestly, I've actually never really practiced diving, but I've ever since I was a kid, if I had the slightest chance to get to a, a shuttle and get it back, I would do it. And coaches over the years have told me, like, maybe sometimes it's better to kind of save the energy because if I dive and I end up one meter outside of the court, there's re- really no chance that I'm going to get the next one anyway. Uh, but I, I just can't help it. Uh, I, I think it's a lot of fun diving and getting the shuttle back in the most uh, impossible situation. Uh, so I've just done it naturally from a, a young age and uh, then kept on doing it. I think I started doing it because I was I was quite small when I was uh, a junior player. I only started really growing when I was 14, 15 years old. So yeah, I kind of had to dive to, to get the, the shuttles back. And uh, yeah, that, that's really how it started. And I, I just can't help myself. Uh, if, I, if I can get it by diving, I'm, I'm gonna dive. <laughs> yeah, whenever I whenever I see the look in your eyes as well, it is I'm getting this shuttle at any cost. It doesn't matter what what happens. <laughs> I'm just going to get it. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> it, it just it gives me some sort of a satisfying feeling 
if I do actually get it, like e- even if I lose the rally, it's hard to say it doesn't matter, but it doesn't really matter. If I just get that one shot back, I will have this uh, satisfying feeling of, okay, I'm having fun. I'm enjoying the game. And if I play in a, in a big arena, I'm also entertaining the crowd, which is actually important to me that they know that I'm someone who's enjoying the game and they can see it from the way that I, uh, I play. Yep. So if I, if I can, uh, if I can do all that, then, uh, yeah, then I'm going to be happy after the match, no matter what. Oh, that's great. Yeah. How did, how did it feel in the final of the US Open on game point down when you hit it over <laughs> Chongwei's head? How did that one feel? Ah, that, that one felt unbelievable. It is <laughs> by far the, the best shot I've hit in my career. It's a yeah, once in a lifetime shot, no, no doubt about it. Like I can, I can hit the shot in training. And ever since I did that shot, uh, I've been asked to do it many times because uh, as you said, it's, it's on YouTube and it went uh, pretty uh, viral after, uh, after the match. Um, it's crazy how much power you generated there. Yeah, and that, that, that's the one thing. If I do it in training now, it's very difficult for me to actually get it to hit the, the baseline. Uh, again, I don't know if I was playing with a little bit of wind uh, on that, that side of the course. Uh, I, I'm not sure I could do an exact uh, copy of that stroke again. Uh, but yeah, every time I get reminded of it, then, uh, I also start smiling because it was, it was obviously a lot of fun. <laughs> it, it was also a huge anticlimax when I then on 20 all the next point I served into the net <laughs> and then on 21 20 for a Chong Wei uh, I made a, uh, a smash into the net on the third shot <laughs> so so after a fantastic rally fantastic shot I just completely blew it but uh, luckily the, the YouTube videos don't show that yeah they don't at all <laughs> <laughs> So HK, I know that that sounds like one of the best, one of the best badminton moments for you or badminton shots. If we came down to what your fondest memory of your badminton career so far is, mm. what would you say is something that's really special to you that you'll take forever and you'll never give it away? You'll never, yeah, it will just stay with you forever and you'll tell your son about it. You'll tell everyone about it. Yeah, there's really no, no doubt in my mind that it's uh, the, the Thomas Cup victory in, in 2016 in Kunshan, in China. Like, there's so much history in that tournament. Uh, you also, yeah, you briefly said in the introduction that I, I got to to play the deciding game in the final where we beat Indonesia uh, 3-2. Like, bef- before we won it in 2016, Denmark had been in the final nine times uh, since it started back in 1949, I think it is. And they lost every single time. So there was like, we felt like it was kind of a curse uh, that Denmark just couldn't win the gold in Thomas Cup. We've had so many great Thomas Cup teams over the years. And I think we've also had teams that were actually on paper much better than the team we had in 2016. So it's just to be able to hit, to clinch the gold for Denmark and to be part of that team, we had the most yeah, unreal team spirit for that entire week. Uh, you have 10 guys on the team. And all 10 of the guys had at least one important win that, that had significant meaning uh, to how we actually uh, got to be in a position to, to win in the end. So everyone on the team actually made a, a huge uh, contribution uh, to the team, uh, both on court and, but also off court. So it was just, for me, it was a magical week. And uh, I said before that I start smiling when you ask me about the shot. I did against Xiong Wei, but as soon as I start talking about that Thomas Cup win, I just uh, I still get the chills, and yeah, it, it's a time of my life that I uh, I will never forget. And I will for sure also show the videos to uh, Vincent when he uh, gets a little bit older, so he can uh, he can be proud of his dad. <laughs> yeah, even even you talking about it already giving me the chills as to how it would it would feel. <laughs> like honestly, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, and yeah. playing, what was the last, for some, I can't remember exactly, but for some reason I feel that the last shot you played was a cross court from around the head smash or half smash. Was I, it? I'm sure you say that because my cross court around the head smash is the shot I hit like nine out of 10 <laughs> times, but I actually hit it straight down the line. Oh, one, okay. But it was like a, a, a half, half smash. Okay. Uh, I, oh, you I, mixed it up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I watched it a million times, uh, yeah. so I, I remember it pretty, uh, pretty clearly. Um, uh, to be honest, the last three or four rallies, uh, I, I couldn't remember anything of them until I actually watched it on video again. Now I've seen it a million times, so now I feel like I can remember everything. But it was just a big blur, and everything was. Uh, 
it was just I, I couldn't remember anything when I had to do interviews after the match. It was just it also says a bit about how how big it actually was for me and all all the teammates. Uh, it, it meant so much to us and to to Danish badminton in general. Um, but yeah, now I've watched it so many times, and I, of course uh, I remember the celebrations and everything yeah. afterwards, and uh, the reception we got in the airport when we get back home. Yeah, it just had a lot of focus here that uh, we are not used to, and especially I'm not used to. I've never been uh, a world champion, an Olympic champion, anything like that. Uh, I've always been number three, two, three, or four in Denmark. So there's always been guys who are better than me. Uh, but obviously, I got a lot of the attention because it was uh, it happened to be me who, who was on court and clinching uh, clinching the gold. So that was that was a huge experience for me in in every way, uh, both uh, on on court and, and off court afterwards. Yeah, I can just imagine that feeling when you win, you hit the winning shot, and all of your team just ran on the court and there was just celebrations. It's, it's actually a funny story because I was watching that match with one of my really good friends and he doesn't know anything about badminton. And just so that you know, uh, he became your instant fan <laughs> after that one. Match. <laughs> he'd never seen badminton. He, he had seen badminton, but not much before. And after that, he just loved you. <laughs> uh, that's amazing. Uh, shout out to him. Big shout out to him. Man. You're his favorite player. <laughs> And his name's Victor. His name's Victor as well. Oh, all, right. all right. Well, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Victor as well then. <laughs> you heard it here, Victor. <laughs> now, HK, I know that you talked about when you got back home in Denmark and there was a huge reception for you and there was lots of attention and lots of celebrations because you brought home the Thomas Cup. And from my perspective in Australia, and I think in a lot of different countries, we all assume that badminton is a very, very big sport in Denmark because Denmark because you have world-class players, you have a lot of leagues and a lot of players travel to Denmark, live in Denmark and train in Denmark so that they can play in the leagues and play around the, in the European circuits. But just from your opinion and in comparison to the other popular sports in Denmark, is badminton really that big in Denmark? It, it's big in terms of participation levels. Uh, like we, we have a lot of members in the clubs, but it's never been like the sport that was uh, shown on TV a lot or had a lot of media attention in, in general. Uh, I think it's, if you count the, the members, I think we are the, the sixth, fifth or sixth biggest sport in Denmark. Uh, but football, uh, soccer and handball are by far the two biggest sports in, in, in Denmark and they almost steal all the attention. It's unbelievable how much focus we have on those two sports. Um, but the last, I'd say six or seven years after one of the national TV channels in, in Denmark actually bought the rights to, to show all the international badminton events, uh, they really started pushing it. So I'd say in the last six or seven years, it, it's grown uh, quite a bit uh, attention-wise. Uh, then actually, for some reason, we have lost members in the clubs, but uh, it, it's still, yeah, the fifth or sixth biggest, but it's... It's not really big in the way that uh, everyone here would know who I am, for example. You, you would need to be quite into sports to, to actually yeah, know, know my name. Of course, a guy like Victor Axelsen is, is really famous, but it, it all depends on Denmark. If you do well in the Olympics, you will have a good name and you will be, you'll be famous. But yeah, if, if you don't really do anything in Olympics, you have to be a handball player or you have to be a soccer player to... Uh, to really become a, a huge uh, star here. So what's the perception of badminton like? So say, for example, I was a young kid at school and I was, I was around my peers and telling them that I was a badminton player. I mean, over, over in Australia, it's not, it's not a really cool thing to, to tell everybody. What's it like at, uh, I guess, it's, it's hard to say, I suppose you're, you're 33 now, turning 34, but what's, it, what's the perception of badminton like? I would say the same. Actually, it's not necessarily seen as a cool sport to play. Like if when when I was nineteen, twenty, twenty-one years old, if I told people, if they asked me what I did, and I said, "Well, I'm a badminton player," they, they would always ask, "Is it possible to make a living out of badminton?" Like they, they don't really understand that it's also a professional sport. People see it more as a it's just a recreational sport where you do it to. Uh, to, to get some exercise and, and have fun. I think in, in general, people think here in Denmark that badminton is fun to play. Uh, everyone here has tried it in school at some point. 
I would say at least 90% of the Danes have tried it at some point. Uh, but they don't really understand that it's it's a professional sport like uh, tennis or uh, yeah, foot and soccer or handball or whatever. So, so the perception is still that it's maybe not the coolest uh, sport to to be good at. But I think the perception is also changing a little bit now with the increased media attention from uh, this national TV channel because they are really showcasing it. They're showing it a lot and they're trying to push it on the social media and on the uh, on their website and everything, so so they've really tried to kind of hype us over the the past uh, yeah, five, six, seven years. And luckily, it's been in a period where we also we've done really well. We have a lot of, especially men singles, who's been uh, has been doing great. So almost every time they show a uh, a tournament on TV, there will be a, a Dane uh, playing in the quarterfinal, semifinal, uh, stuff like that. So that that obviously helps a little bit on the uh, how, how people perceive the the sport in general. Yeah, and I guess with perceiving, I guess players of your caliber as well, sort of the high professional players, the top you know top twenty, top fifty players. I guess most people would think that there would be significant funding, they'd have a high wage and good sponsorships and lots of prize money and everything's paid for. But, you know, what's it really like for our audience to know? Yeah, well, for me, there's been good salaries for a couple of years when I was ranked around top, top 10 in the world. But in general, we don't get a lot of funding in Denmark from the uh, National uh, Federation. Uh, like I get around 15% of my... Uh, expenses paid for by the federation so i pay around 85 percent of all the expenses from traveling uh, out of my own pocket i I know that's very different to how a lot of the other national team do do things uh, but we have never gotten any salary for actually playing on the national team we we get some funding to pay for the tournament expenses and, and that's it that changed four years ago we started getting a little bit from team events so for example when we won the thomas cup uh, we got around uh, 2,500 US dollars for, for winning, which is basically the world championships. So it's not something you will become rich <laughs> yeah, on. Can't retire off that. Um, <laughs> no, no, exactly. Uh, and that, that's before taxes, by the way. Um, wow. Yeah, but I really sh- I'm, I'm not complaining because if you reach... I would say top 20, top 25 in singles. It's possible for, uh, at least for the guys here, to do pretty decent uh, sponsorship deals. And it's obviously those sponsorship deals that make it possible for me to pay those 85% of my my tournament expenses because it is very expensive to travel the world. I I play between 17 and 20 uh, international events a year. And I would say... 80% 80% of those are in Asia. So it's long flights and it's, uh, you, you have to arrive three or four days before because of the, the time difference. So you, you just you spend a lot of money on hotels and flights over the course of a year. But yeah, down to the, to the sponsors and everything, it's, it's been possible for me for, for many years. But I also made a very conscious decision when I was, uh, when I was younger that I wanted to do this full time. Uh, so I decided to stay uh, living with my parents until I was uh, actually until I was 24 years old. Uh, I, I don't know if it's normal in Australia, but I can tell you it's not very normal in Denmark. You usually move out when you're 18, 19, uh, at latest around 20. Uh, but I could just see that if I needed to pay for an apartment, I had to pay rent and food and everything. There would be no money to to actually travel around and, and play badminton. Uh, so yeah, I, I made a decision that I wanted to stay home and and spend all of my money on uh, on badminton instead. I'm I'm happy I chose to do that uh, for sure. Uh, I don't regret it at all. But it's not like we get everything uh, paid for in any way. Yeah, I think that could be a common perception that everything would be paid for. And by the sounds of it, it the, it seems like a the most log- logical and wise decision to stay home at that time while you pursued your badminton career. So. Yeah. yeah, definitely. If if I, if I hadn't chosen to do that, I wouldn't have had the career yeah. I have today. Uh, I, I would have had to work a lot more, uh, doing something else to yeah, make money. And then, of course, I, I would not be able to train with the same quality. I wouldn't be able to play all the same events uh, either. Uh, but but I also have to say that I, I actually think it's one of the reasons why we do so well in, in Denmark, that we don't get everything paid for. We don't just 
get things uh, handed to us. We need to actually make an investment of our own time and energy and money. So when you travel to Australia to play the Australian Open, or if you travel to Singapore to, to play the Singapore Open, you know you paid so much and you invested so much of your your own funds. So you want to do your best. You, you have to because it's your own money you're actually wasting. I have a feeling sometimes that if, if you're from one of the smaller countries and you get everything paid for, you sometimes just, just take it for granted. It doesn't really matter if it goes well or goes bad in this particular tournament because you're also going to go to the next one and the federation is, is still paying. Of course, you have to perform at some uh, point in time, but there's just a, an added investment from all the Danish uh, players. And I think especially compared to the rest of Europe, I think it's actually one of the reasons why we just keep on producing uh, players that are that are really really, really focused and really, really, uh, yeah, hardworking. Uh, and I'm not saying the other countries don't produce any, but there is an, an obvious difference between Denmark and the rest of Europe. It's like you're almost hungry for those results, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a good way, good way to put it. You, you want to get some kind of reward from the, the investment you do. Just to go rogue for, for a bit, um, HK, what would you be doing if you weren't a badminton player, if you didn't go down the badminton path? I'm 100% certain that I would do something uh, within the field of sports. Uh, I Usually, if I get that question, I would say that I would be a tennis player. Because <laughs> uh, when I started playing tennis uh, during summertime, uh, back when I was yeah, 12, after I quit soccer, uh, I... To be honest, I, I enjoyed it just as much as, as badminton. I, I think I only carried on with badminton because I had started that much earlier and I was already yeah, beginning to get a lot of uh, cool experiences traveling uh, Denmark and Europe with, uh, with the national uh, junior teams. Uh, but had I started tennis when I was five, uh, I, I think I could have become a tennis player instead. Um, then if I could have become professional, I don't know. Uh, we don't really have a rich tennis history in, in Denmark, but yeah, you never know. I, I'm a, a huge sports guy and it, it's what I love the most. So I'm, I'm sure I would work within the field of sports in, in some capacity. Yeah, awesome. Um, and following on from Henry's question as to what you'd be doing, you've got a family now. You're trying to juggle your family life, your badminton career and your wife is competing as well. She's training a lot for her events and her competitions as well. How do you fit everything in? You've got bills to pay, you've got rent to pay, you've got family to support. How do you, how do, you do it all? Well, it is the biggest challenge that I've had uh, over the past two years when we've had uh, uh, Vincent ever since he was born. Because um, my wife is, as you said, also competing. She's also traveling a little bit to Holland, Sweden, Norway to, to compete. Uh, and my wife is Norwegian, so her family doesn't live any anywhere close to us. They live up in Norway. Um, my dad is dead, so we only have my mom left, who is uh, close to here, and she is the main reason, actually, why it is possible for us to to still have this lifestyle. Uh, she retired from working uh, three years ago, so about a year before Winston was born. And she is she's helping out a lot if uh, if we can't really make the the calendars uh, fit me and uh, me and my wife. We we try to make it work so we are not away uh, at the same time. But with me being away at least a third of the year, it's it's pretty impossible to make it work every single week. So my mom is is helping out a lot, watching uh, yeah, Vincent for a few days when uh, whenever there's a clash between me and uh, my wife's calendar. Uh, but it, it it is a huge challenge for us, and it takes a lot of planning. Uh, there's a lot of logistics uh, involved, and it's also uh, it's also taking uh, its toll on me in in general. I'm not enjoying traveling just as much now as I was before mm-hmm. Winston was born. Um, I, I still really love to play the events. I love to compete. Uh, I I love to go to <laughs> other countries, and I love to travel. But I don't love it when I then lose and I have to wait for five, six, seven days mm-hmm. until the next event and I'm away from home and I know it's stressful for my wife and uh, yeah, to, to, to make it all work. It's, it's an added pressure and it's an added uh, 
added concerns that is everything okay at home? And even though they say everything is okay, is it really? Uh, so I, I have a lot of more concerns now than I did did two years ago, and uh, I can just feel that it's this is not something that I would enjoy doing for ten more years. Uh, but naturally, my age also says that I can't anyway. So. <laughs> Yeah, it, it yeah. it's it's challenging compared to what it was before. But again, I, I wouldn't change it for the world. Yeah, and so in the last two years, I mean, how have you managed to cope with having such a busy life and, and dealing with those less than ideal results that you may have had, and and coping with the stress of not knowing how life is really on on the other side? Yeah, I, I'm I'm struggling to to do it in a, a really good way, like coping with it. I think that's also where you can see that my results the last two years has not been great compared to the, the years before. I, I don't think that has anything to do with my age. I, I still, I'm still in, in great shape and uh, I don't feel like I'm, I'm too old to perform, but it, it is the challenge of making everything uh, work and just focus on the badminton that's, that's troubling me uh, a little bit. Uh, I tried to work with my sports psychologist. I tried to talk to him about it quite a bit. And he's given me some some tools to try and focus on the things that are actually important at, and the things that I can actually control when I'm uh, away. And me and my wife, we try to have really honest conversations about how to make it work. And is it even possible for me to go to this particular event? So like a very concrete thing we've done is uh, I've said that I'm, I'm not going to do uh, trips to Asia that last more than two weeks. Mm. Before that, I, I often could, I could go for three week trips or uh, yeah, even four weeks sometimes. Uh, but it, it's just not yeah, feasible anymore for me. Maybe my wife could do it, but after a couple of weeks, I'm thinking more about what's going on back home and I want to go back and, uh, and see my son. So it doesn't really matter if I... Uh, if I play in week three, because my, my head is uh, is somewhere else. Uh, so that's like one very concrete thing that I've changed to to try and uh, cope with it. So it's just making small adjustments and uh, and being very honest about it also with the with my family, so we can we can adapt as as well as uh, possible. Yeah, I think that's that's really good. That's a really smart thing to do, and. I can't imagine how it'd feel to be overseas so far away on the other side of the world and not know what's going on at home and that extra stress. And there's no wonder long trips aren't great. And like you said, HK, by the third week, you probably wouldn't be in the right mindset to perform really well anyway. So yeah, I, I feel that that's something that I think a lot of people wouldn't think about being a, a big concern. They think, oh yeah, there's a family there, but the actual ins and outs of it and the feelings that do happen when you're away for so long and you've got such a young family, I think that's really, mm. I think that's really tricky. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But it all, of course, it also differs from family to family because not no one has the exact same situation, right? Like maybe someone else would have a lot of uh, grandparents close by, and then it's not the same kind of issue. But uh, yeah, we all just have uh, our own issues and need need to find a way to to adapt and, uh, and make it work. And, we we are still trying to figure it out in the best way possible, but uh, yeah, I, I'm actually positive that it's going to be even better for us in, uh, in 2020. Yeah, great. Yeah, it certainly sounds like you've got some plans in place now, and we hope that you know you manage to get everything sorted so that you can continue to play and love the sport and produce some great results for your fans. I will for sure keep on going as long as I, mm-hmm. as I can. Uh, and even if I, I'm not going to play international events at some point, uh, it's not something that I'm going to uh, stop doing right now. But when I do, I, I know that I'm going to carry on playing still. Uh, I will play the Danish league or uh, yeah, whatever I can play. Uh, I, I, I love playing too much to uh, just completely quit the sport. So uh, I, I think I'm going to be a lifelong badminton player. Uh, at least uh, I hope so. My body will probably also have a say in, in that, but. <laughs> uh, my my goal is to keep playing uh yeah as long as possible yeah absolutely that's the dream yeah <laughs> and with everything that's going on and all the all the challenges that you've had throughout your life your career and now these challenges coming up here what would you say it has taught you about yourself or about life with regards to what you've learned through all these challenges uh well i would say that 
just badminton in general has taught me so much because I've been traveling so much that I've met people from so many different cultures uh, and you, you get a completely different perspective uh, on life. All the challenges that I'm facing, I, I don't really see it as uh, huge challenges uh, compared to what people face of challenges in, in other parts of the world. Like I, I was just reminded yesterday that I, I, I went to visit a Solibath uh, project in Indonesia. I know you guys know Solibath from uh, Rafael. You had him on the podcast yep. uh, uh, some weeks ago, uh, where families they just live on a like a huge dump. Uh, so people go there to dump off all the garbage. They, they live there, mm. and when I went to visit them, they were all smiles, and it was all about just being happy with what they had. And uh, they had two badminton courts, so when they could go on court, they were just having so much fun and enjoying it. So uh, I'm trying really hard not to complain so much about my situation, because I'm in a, a pretty uh, pretty good situation. Uh, it's not a problem that I have a kid. It just makes it more difficult to travel so much, which is uh, normal, but it's something I've chosen myself to do. So. I don't see it as challenges in, in, in that way, but obviously I can also get tired and start thinking in a negative way. But then I, I just try to remind myself of all the things I, I see around the world and yeah, then uh, remind myself that I'm actually pretty privileged with the, the life that, that I live. So, so I try to kind of suck it up and then work through it. And as you also said in the introduction, when I had to describe myself, I kind of describe myself as a hardworking, no mind minded guy uh, and I, I think that's how I try to solve most challenges to to work hard and uh, be be open about both what the problem is but also uh, how to uh, how to solve it so I think that's the most important lessons I've learned from from Babinson and the challenges uh, over the years to to be open about both the problem and and the the solution and and work hard to get through it and uh, no, no secret recipe it's just uh, yeah hard work yeah hard work and being grateful for where you are because I think yourself, me, Henry, and anyone actually listening to this podcast, we have a life that only that people would only dream of. So just bringing it back to that and being grateful for where you are and, and yeah, it's a challenge, but look, in the bigger perspective of things, it's actually not much of a challenge at all. It's a privileged challenge. Yeah, so so true, so true. But it doesn't mean, of course, you can still have bad days and uh, you can think that, things are pretty difficult at times but yeah as you say if you look at it in the in the bigger perspective it's uh it is a privileged life and just the fact that we can uh, we can sit here and, and chat for for an hour for a podcast also shows that i, I think our lives are, are, are not too bad in, in general absolutely life is pretty good <laughs> mm. Now, I can, I can, I was just i was thinking as, as you were talking hk about going to the dump and Mm. And how sad that would have been and that, that unique perspective that it would provide on your life. But then as you talked about the children smiling, that actually brought a smile to my face. As it, it reminded me of the conversation that we had with Raphael yeah. um, and how, yeah, how important it is to be grateful for where you are. Mm. And uh, I guess to throw a question at the both of you guys, where do you think you rank in terms of quality of life in out of the seven to eight billion people in the world, top one percent. I'm gonna make yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say it's a one two percent, something like that. Yeah, it's an incredibly privileged life mm. that we live for sure. So, HK, with badminton being such an important part of your life, and then you were playing tennis and also soccer or football as well. What sport do you want Vincent to play? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the correct answer is I want him to play the sport that he will enjoy the most. Absolutely. Because mm -hmm. he's going to choose. Uh, but I am going to try and show him what badminton is all about. Uh, <laughs> awesome. There's no, no doubt about that. Yeah. As I've said many times now, I, I love the sport and I think it's a fantastic sport. You, you learn so much from it. Also, if you don't become an international player like me, there's still a lot of uh, things you, you learn from, from playing badminton, uh, not just from the sport, but also from all the social activities and everything that it means to be part of a club. You, you just you learn a lot of uh, human traits that, that I think are, are really, really important. Uh, so I am going to try and, uh, and sign him up for a badminton club, and then we'll see if he enjoys it or not. And then it's going to be, be up to him. 
Uh, we actually have a, a tennis club uh, almost as a neighbor to where we live here. So it will be obvious for him to also go, go and try that. And we have a football club here as well. So he, he has a lot of options to, to choose from. But uh, I, I wouldn't mind if he, uh, if he began loving badminton in the same way as, uh, as I've done. Uh, that, that, would be, that would be sweet. But as long as, as he's doing something he enjoys, I, I'm, I'm going to be happy. But it's very important to both me and my wife that he actually does do some sports uh, in some way or capacity. He doesn't have to be a professional athlete in any way. But uh, just for his general uh, health and his, uh, with all the things you can learn from, again, from being part of a club or a sports team, uh, I think it, it would be really good for his development. Or oh, we think it would be really good for his development. So, so we are going to try and uh, push that upon him in, in a way where, where he will uh, find enjoyment out of it. Yeah, I can imagine it'd be pretty hard to avoid sports with you and your wife around. <laughs> um, I was actually, I was thinking that you were going to say tennis instead of badminton, but I'm glad you, <laughs> I'm glad you said badminton there. <laughs> yeah, I, I love tennis, but I, I think, especially in Denmark, badminton is a better sport to be involved with the, with the structure and the system here. We, it's not a great tennis nation. Denmark, uh, we, we have Kalina Wasniaki, but she is, uh, she is the odd exception. We don't really have a system in place to, uh, to really produce top athletes or have a system that's really working extremely well. At least not, not that I know of. So I, I think badminton is, uh, is one of the more well-structured sports here, apart from, from uh, handball and, uh, and soccer, as I've mentioned before. Those two are in a, a class... Uh, Uh, above everything else okay hk we've talked a lot about badminton and different sports and a bit about family as well but this is a bit of a fun question here and it's basically it's it's something we asked gronya back in our episode when we recorded with gronya and what the question is it's just about you and you telling us something that people don't usually know about you is there something you want to share yeah i I kind of knew that you were going to ask the question. I've, I've <laughs> really been trying to uh, come up with something. And the best that I can give you guys is that I actually, it's still going to be badminton related, but I actually honestly believe that I would have become an even better mixed doubles player if I had tried becoming a uh, doubles player instead of singles. Oh, wow. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, I have a, uh, yeah, that's a fun story to it. Back in 2000 and. I think it's 2010. I played the Malaysia Open uh, Super Series, as it was called back then. Yeah. I played Chen Jin from China in the uh, first round. He was the defending world champion at the time. And I lost, I think it was 21-16 or 21-17 in the third game. Uh, I was still uh, a young player. I hadn't really had my big breakthrough at that time. Uh, but I, I was so happy with my performance. Uh, I played my best badminton ever, and as I said, he was the reigning world champion. So it was obviously a really, really uh, good performance by me. Then I come back home to Denmark. I'm at one of my friends' house, uh, Scott Evans. Yep. Yeah, nice Scott. You know him. We should get him on the podcast, Scott. <laughs> yeah, he's a funny guy. Yeah. Yeah, you should. You should. That would be a lot of. <laughs> yeah, that would be a lot of fun. But yeah, I'm, I'm, at, I'm at his house, and then I get a text message from uh, from the former national coach of Denmark he just quit the national team two years before that and he said that uh, I should really consider making the switch to to mixed doubles and I was like what that doesn't make sense I've just uh, played the best badminton yeah of my life uh, and I've always dreamt about being a, a singles player uh, but he he saw some things in my game that he, he thought suited mixed a lot better uh, and he saw some limitations in my my singles game as well but uh, i told him that I, I wanted to carry on chasing my dream in, in singles and uh, i'm really happy that i did but over the years i've actually started to understand why he said that and i also enjoy playing mixed and i i actually try to to do it every now and then i i chose to participate in the nationals last year in mixed doubles where i lost in the semi-final uh, so I, I just I see what he actually meant back then, and uh, I, I have to say that I actually agree with him that it could have become uh, I could have become even better than than what I actually reached in, in men's singles. That's yeah, interesting. Well. Uh, but mm. yeah, I'm happy with what I chose, and uh, I, I I wouldn't change it. But Absolutely. it's just yeah, it's a it's a fun uh, fun, fun thing. Fact, yeah. Who did he uh, tell you who you would be playing with when he offered mixed tea? 
Yeah. 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 No, no, because he was not the national team coach oh, yeah. anymore. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he quit, uh, I think, a year or two before, but he, he just said that I, I should consider it. And then, yeah, I don't, I don't know who I was going to be playing with. But in junior years, I was actually playing with Christina Pedersen. Okay. So back then I had a good partner, but uh, I said I didn't want to play mixed anymore to try and focus on my, my singles mm-hmm. back then. Mm. So yeah, who knows? Maybe I could have been the uh, Joachim Fischer, <laughs> Christina. For many years. You still can be. You still can be. It's not too late. Yeah, m- maybe I can play with Granja. I don't know <laughs> what she uh, said to that question, but yeah, maybe I should ask her to play mixed for a few events. I, I can pass a message on. <laughs> yeah, you should do that. And let's see what she says. Looking forward to your mixed doubles campaign, 2020. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think it's a little late to actually try and qualify for 2020, but I yeah, think 2024. In, yeah, 2024. Yeah, yeah. Unless uh, I'm gonna be 38 at that time, that's fine for a doubles player. Spring chicken. I think in yeah, yeah, exactly. In Rio, uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, this Polish guy Robert Matuszak, he was 42 at the time yeah. he played. So. Oh, was he 42? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, <laughs> why not? 38 is still young. Exactly, and you have we have all all your life planned out perfectly by then. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, HK, as a huge podcast listener yourself, what do you think we could do on the badminton podcast that would make it even better? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah. Boom. Henry added this Boom. question in. Yeah, I, yeah, didn't, yeah, yeah, I, I didn't know. That. <laughs> no, no worries, no worries. Uh, well, I think to make it really popular, it's quite important that you have international guests like myself. Mm-hmm. Um, it, Depends on what you're, uh, who you're really targeting. Uh, if you're targeting like a world audience, then I think that's quite important. Uh, no offense to the Australian badminton scene, but it's maybe not the uh, most interesting badminton scene for an Indonesian to hear about, or a Malaysian or a Chinese uh, person. But you've been doing well with that with Rafael last time and me now. Uh, so I think that that's very important that you have international uh, capacities in, in some way. On the podcast, but I think in general with podcasts, the most important thing is that it's continuous. That, that you keep on posting. That there's not if you're posting every second week or every month that you keep this interval going. That it's not like all of a sudden there's a break for four months and then people forget about your podcast. Uh, I think at least for me with the podcast I'm listening to, I, I like that I know it's in these intervals and the show is kind of built up in the same way every time. Of course, there's some tweaks to it every time and different questions, but you, you kind of know what you get every time you listen to an episode. Uh, now, I, I've only heard uh, your episode with Grania. I haven't had time to, to hear any of the others, so I can't really give you that much feedback in regard to what you have done, uh, have been doing. But those would be my, my general advice to have a, a popular podcast, to, to do it continuously and... Uh, Keep it interesting for the listener, but that's yeah, great, pretty, uh, no, no, <laughs> pretty gotcha. Good, good. Yeah. Thank you for that advice. Yeah. All right, moving, moving back to you, back to you. We'll, we'll move back to you. So, what's next for you? What is your tournament calendar looking like for 2020, and what are your goals? Yeah, I'm actually a little bit in doubt what I'm going to do in 2020. I'm signed up for malaysia masters indonesia masters and also thailand masters which is three weeks in a row and i know five minutes ago i said i don't do three weeks trips uh, yeah. but i yeah. <laughs> might have to do an exception uh, in january uh, for two reasons uh, one is that my ranking has now dropped to to 32 and that's the uh, the cutting line for entering the uh, the biggest tournaments there's only a 32 in the main draw and there's no qualifying for the biggest events so i'm really in need of some ranking points and in january there's not a lot of uh, possibilities for tournaments there's only those uh, three and also the start of february so i might have to actually do all three of them to, to have a chance to to stay in the main draw for all england switches in uh, in march but I, I haven't completed the side yet i'm gonna play at least two of them and then We'll see if, uh, if I'm going to do all three. My biggest goal result-wise for, uh, for 2020 is uh, to be part of the Danish Thomas Cup team. Uh, we play, uh, the Thomas Cup is going to be played in, in Aarhus in Denmark uh, in 2020, which is the first time it's outside of uh, Asia. 
So obviously, I would uh, I would love to be part of uh, of that team. Being part of the Thomas Cup team is uh, one of the most uh, special uh, things in professional badminton in, in my eyes. So I would really, really love to be part of uh, of that team. And that that that's my biggest goal to to be to be selected to be part of uh, of the team. Yeah, and that's something that hopefully you'll be able to relive those memories back from the Thomas Cup victory in yeah. China. I think that's the only thing that could beat actually winning for the first time after nine finals would be if we actually won. Winning on, for the second. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> winning for the second time in, on home, home, soil, yeah, yeah, home. home soil for mm. the first time outside of Asia. And I think we have a team that has the chance to do it. We are not the favorites on paper, but I think we are one of the three or four strongest teams uh, there are. So... Who knows? I, I think we we have a chance if I, if I make the team, but it's also not that easy to to make the Danish Thomas Cup team in men's singles as it is right now. We have a lot mm. of guys doing uh, really well. Yep, absolutely. Exciting times ahead, anyway. Yeah, it is for sure. It is for sure. I might be seeing you in maybe Malaysia, and Indonesia. I'm not sure if I'm going yet, but all right to be confirmed, maybe. Yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> that would be cool. Then maybe maybe Good. we can do a mini part. Yeah, that's right. You'll have to fly over as well. I'll bring my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> you are more than welcome. Now, HK, we're just wrapping up here. Is there anything else that you'd like to talk about or just let out into the world or any call, call, call outs or shout outs on the podcast? Uh, well, I can say that I'm hoping to start my own podcast next year. Fantastic. Uh, awesome. Which is, uh, it's not really going to be a competitor to this one. It's going to be quite different. Uh, right now, the working title is uh, A Year on Tour with Pitting Hoops. Oh, great. Uh, and, yeah. My idea is to, to start a podcast where it's going to be quite quite short episodes, 5, 10, 15 minutes every time, but it's going to be recorded every time I'm out traveling. Uh then at the end of uh, of days, I, I'm gonna do a a small mini part where I uh, I update guys on uh, what we're doing and to how training is going, how the matches are going. Try to let them in to my mind and uh, see what's going on after the matches, before the matches, uh, to try and uh, to try and let the fans in a little bit closer. Uh, I'm I'm a big fan of uh, of social media, and I'm trying to be very honest in my, both my Instagram and Facebook, and let people uh, in. But I think it gets even more personal if it's uh, me actually talking and uh, yeah, recording five, ten, fifteen minutes uh, about what's going on. Uh, so I'm I'm working a little bit on uh, on that idea right now. I'm not 100% ready with the. Uh, entire blueprint for the podcast but it's definitely something i want to uh, incorporate next year so a year until with bidding who's you need to uh, watch out for that next year nice and it'll be in english right so we can all listen yeah to it will it. be in english nice right yeah <laughs> I, th- I think also great, most great, of the great. listeners will just like me have english as the second language so it doesn't really matter that my english is not absolutely perfect uh, so i think uh, I-, I should do it in english to Get the most fans, uh, give the most fans a, a chance to listen. I think in, on social media, also around 80% or something like that of the followers I have are, are not Danish. Uh, so it, mm. it would be, yeah, it would be unfair of me to do it in Danish and uh, kind of cut off uh, the 80% of people that, that actually <laughs> do follow me. Yeah. Well, we look forward to listening to it. Yeah. Cool. I'll also uh, keep listening to yours. Thank you. <laughs> And HK, one of the questions we usually ask towards the end of the podcast for any guest is based on all of the information you've given, the story you've had, the experiences that you've had in your career and in your life, if there was an aspiring athlete out there trying to do what you're, you've done and what you're doing right now, what advice would you give them that you've learned throughout your career? My best advice is to to make sure that you're having fun. Uh, and again, I don't mean it in a way where every time you go to training, you have to be laughing all the time and uh, just getting stomach cramped from, from laughing. It's not meant in that way, but it's meant in the way that you should you should enjoy what you're doing. Uh, if it's really hard work and you're getting so tired and uh, you have acid in your legs, like like you can't move anything, you, you need to find some kind of way to enjoy that if you if you want to be a uh, a world-class athlete if every time it gets hard you also feel like it's hard and you, you don't get motivated by it then it, it's not the life for you. you you need to find a way to enjoy that and, and have fun uh, and then i think to actually do that 
the most important thing is that you're open-minded. Um, you, you can have your own ideas of how you want to do your training and what's important to you. And I think you need to have that. But you also have to be open-minded to all the inputs you can get from coaches, from colleagues, other players, basically every, anyone. A all the inputs you get, you have to be open uh, open to it. And then you, you can tweak it uh, in the way that it, it fits into uh, to the way you want to do uh, things. Uh, I think a good example is the five-man singles we have in the national team in Denmark right now. Victor, Anas Antons, and Gemke, Jan Jürgensen, and myself. We have all done things very differently, but we train together every day where we do basically the same program, but we all tweak the exercises a little bit so it suits our game and our weaknesses and strengths that we need to work on. So if you're not open-minded, uh, I think it's going to be really difficult to become a world-class uh, athlete because uh, you're not going to get the inputs you need to to push yourself to, uh, to the next level. Uh, so yeah, I would say those uh, two things. You need to find a way to, to have fun with what you're doing, even if it's hard. And you need to be open-minded to uh, all the input you can get. But it doesn't mean you have to take it on board 100%. You can take whatever suits your uh, yeah your style of play and your, your style of pushing uh, forward. Yeah, absolutely. I really like those takeaways. And for me, the, the real big one for me is about the fun. Mm. Because I think, especially in Australia, I'm not sure about in Denmark, but especially in Australia, badminton is very fun to start off with. And we're behind in the sport, <laughs> behind other countries in terms of our level. <laughs> but in terms of participation rates, I think a lot of people start dropping out when it starts getting very serious and regimented. Mm. And I think that fun element is so important yeah. as a part of the sport and developing the sport as a whole nation as well. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, I, I think if people start dropping out, if it gets too serious, I think they should just go back to actually focus on, on the fun part of it. And then I'm sure if if it grows on you, the sport, then at some point you will be ready to, to do it even more serious and, and find a, a way to, to enjoy that part. We, we also do have examples of that in Denmark where people, yeah, they've been training a lot and then they quit for a year or two and then they found out, okay, I, I now I'm ready to to do this more serious. Now I've had my year or two to <laughs> pursue other things, or I just have a, a bit of fun going out or whatever whatever they want to do. A guy like Anas uh, Scott Rasmussen, who's our top ranked men's doubles player right now, he he didn't play badminton for uh, yeah almost a year. Mas Conrad Peterson, uh, same story. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they needed to have this break uh, just to to find the the love and the uh, for for the sport again and find a way to to enjoy it and. Yeah, now they're uh, two of the most serious guys we have in the, in the doubles department. So mm -hmm. it, you, you don't have to become serious when you're 10 years old or 12 years old. You can also uh, train a little bit less for a, a period of time and then start again. It, it, it's all fine as, as long as you find the right motivation uh, to, to have fun, then, then I'm sure you can, uh, you can still make it even if you take a small break. That, yeah, that, that's awesome, HK. Yeah. So on behalf of Henry and I, we just want to say thanks so much for coming, coming on to the Badminton Podcast. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Very nice uh, talking to you guys. And you can uh, feel just from talking to you also that you have the uh, same kind of passion for the sport than, uh, that I do. Uh, so it's just, uh, as, I, as you also said in the beginning, I'm, I'm just a badminton fan who, uh, who became really good at badminton. So it's just awesome for me to... Uh, to know that there are projects like uh, your podcast out there as well. Uh, I've been thinking many years that there's not enough Amazon podcasts on the market. So I, uh, I wish you all the best with uh, this podcast and I hope you're going to keep on going for, uh, for many years. So you will become the biggest Amazon podcast in Australia. In the world. Of course. <laughs> uh, in the world after, so. after yours. After yours. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So HK, if people want to follow your progress, so of course they can listen to your podcast when you release it and please let us know about that. Yeah. But how can they follow your progress on your socials? What are your socials? They should go follow me on Instagram where I'm just the uh, HK Whittinghouse is my username. And they can also follow me on Facebook. Uh, I think my username there is Hans Christian Whittinghouse. Uh, but I'm sure if they just... Uh, if they do a search for Whittinghams, they will uh, find my uh, my fan page. Yeah, I, it's not the most common name, so it doesn't give that many hits. <laughs> I'm more active on my Instagram than I is on my Facebook. While I'm I'm quite active on both, and uh, I 
I actually try to reply to, to most people that, that uh, comment on the stuff that I, I put up. I, I don't reply to all the DMs I get. I get quite a, quite a few, especially when we're out at events. But if I, if I put up something and I ask for feedback, if people actually do give me feedback, I, uh, I, I try to reply to everyone. So they should feel free to, uh, to hit me up if uh, there's something that they want to ask me. And I also regularly do uh, Q and A's on my, uh, on my Instagram actually. So they should follow me on those two, uh, social medias. And then, uh, they should of course start listening to the podcast when I release it, which will be in January is my goal. That's awesome. Fantastic. Yeah. So for the audience, Thank you so much for tuning in. And before we finish up, I'd like to say what my most valuable takeaways from this conversation were, if that's okay with you, HK. Sure. And so I guess one of one of the key things, and obviously you mentioned it as one of your key advices, is to have fun, enjoy the process. Uh, and I really like that um, because a lot of the times uh, people are looking to achieve a result and, and not looking at you know, the actual process and actually enjoying um, the training, enjoying the hard work. And from, from this conversation, everyone can tell that HK and even from your badminton, you know, badminton exposes you as a person, you are a very hardworking person. Um, And it's great to see that. And it's great to see your optimism um, and open-mindedness as well. And sharing that with the audience and, Look, I wish you the best of luck with balancing your badminton and home life and hope that Vincent becomes a successful badminton player. I don't want to push him in that direction, but I hope I see him on the circuit one day. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that will be a lot of fun. Thanks a lot, guys. Absolutely. So from Henry and I, thanks so much for tuning into the badminton podcast. We're going to try to get more international players like HK onto the show so they can share their stories and you can learn from them because... They've got such a wealth of experience and unique experiences and just HK talking about his experiences, hitting the winner over Chong Wei's head from between the legs, as well as his Thomas Cup, the match that he played that won the Thomas Cup for Denmark. They were things that were really (laughs) special and I really, I had goosebumps when I was listening to it. So make sure you recommend the podcast to everyone that you you know and everyone who loves badminton because that's what we're about we really love badminton and we just want to expose the world to the amazing sport that we all love and that we all play and remember that your love for badminton doesn't stop and stay on the court share it with everyone if you want to connect with us you can connect with us via instagram facebook YouTube or LinkedIn via our social media handle V-O-L-A-N-T-W-E-A-R Volantware or via our website www.volantware.com Thanks so much. Thanks, Thanks HK. HK. Thank you. Bye guys. Cheers. Bye. Bye. This podcast was brought to you by Volantware, the most versatile badminton apparel you'll ever own.